بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ الحمد للہ نحمد و نستعین و نستغفر و نؤمن به و نتوکل علیہ و نعوذ باللہ من شرور انفسنا و من سیئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مذل له ومن يذلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله وصلى الله تبارك وتعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم As I mentioned earlier that the whole purpose of us gathering firstly in Oxford and now in London is for the intention or is for the purpose of purifying our heart is for purifying our soul so that when our heart becomes soft and subtle and tender it then becomes easy for us to act upon the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and more importantly follow the blessed ways of our beloved Habib Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As I was mentioning earlier that there are many many ahadith which talks about the importance of rectifying our heart which talks about the imp importance of doing islah of our heart. The very famous hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that there is an organ in your body, there is a flesh in your body, that if you manage to rectify this, your entire body becomes rectified. However, if you do not rectify this, and you let your heart develop evil characteristics, vile characteristics, maladies such as hatred, hasad and jealousy and riya and shirk, then what will happen? Your entire body will also become bad. Your entire body will also not be rectified. And then Rasulullah then says, Allah wa al qalb, that this organ or this flesh is the heart is the qalb and is the spiritual heart another hadith which i mentioned earlier but for the brothers who went there early on in oxford the famous hadith of musnad ahmad where rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was with a group of companions and he said to the sahabas and to the companions and he said this for three days consecutively and he said that indeed a person from jannah Indeed, a dweller or an inhabitant of Jannah will appear before you. And on all those three occasions, the famous companion, Hazrat Saad bin Abi Waqqas who came. Now, one of the Sahabis, one of the companions who were with Rasulullah they then afterwards went and met Hazrat Saad bin Abi Waqqas who and they said to him that, can I spend the night with you? I want to spend the night, I want to see what you do exactly. So this Sahabi, he spent the entire night with Hazrat Saad bin Abi Waqqas al-Anhu, but he did not see anything, you could say, amazing, anything extraordinary, which you can lay your finger and say, okay, this is, is what is taking Hazrat Saad bin Abi Waqqas al-Anhu to Jannah and Paradise. Don't get me wrong, Hazrat Saad bin Abi Waqqas al-Anhu, he was doing this tahajjud and other kind of good deeds and tasbihat but this sahabi couldn't really see anything a standout thing which was taking him to jannah and paradise so afterwards this companion he then speaks to Hazrat Saad bin Abi Waqqas when he says to him that look the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi sallam is giving you glad tidings is giving you basharat that you are going to enter jannah and paradise but I've spent the entire night with you I haven't actually seen you do anything which I can say that this is taking you to Jannah and Paradise. So Hazrat Saad bin Waqqas who said, well, I'm not hiding or concealing anything. This is what I do. I spend the night in Tahajjud. I do my Tasbihat. I pray my Salah. I don't do anything other than this. 
But then Hazrat Sa'd bin Waqqas who said to this companion, however, there is one thing which I do, and that is before I go to sleep, before I retire to bed, I retire having no hatred, no hasad, and no grudge against another Muslim brother, against another Sahabi, against another companion. So then the Sahabi then said, this is what has made you reach the rank which you have reached, i.e. Jannah and Paradise. Why? Because he would go to sleep having no grudges against another Muslim brother, having no hatred or rancor or even envy against another Muslim brother. So therefore, this is what was taking Hazrat Sa'd bin Waqqas to Jannah and to Paradise. So these are just two ahadith I mentioned, which talks about the importance of doing islah of our heart, rectifying our heart, making sure that what we do, like we make our heart tender, so that it becomes easy for us to abide by Allah's command and by the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A very famous tabi and also a very famous scholar and faqih of his time, Abdullah bin Mubarak rahmatullahi. He once mentioned that wrong actions or unlawful things, haram things, kills the heart. Now you may be thinking, how can wrong things or haram thing kills the heart? It kills the heart because when you do haram and unlawful things, your heart slowly, slowly turns black. A black dot appears. And if you keep on doing haram and unlawful things, then the blackness in your heart escalates. And what you have eventually is your entire heart that is all black. And when you look at it, when your heart becomes black, it's like you're dead. It's like the hayat has gone. It's like you're murda. It's like you're a mayyit, you're a disease, you can't do anything. And remember, when that happens to your heart, that in itself is an azab and a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because then it becomes very, very, very difficult for you to change your life. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Holy Quran regarding Abu <coughs> Jahal and Abu Lahab. They were two staunch enemies of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Allah said to them that Inna lazina kafaru sawaun alayhi ma andar tahum am lam tunzidhum la yuminun, which means that whether you go and explain to them and warn them and give them glad tidings that if you believe in me you will enter Jannah or Paradise, or whether you do not, it doesn't make a difference. La yuminun, they will never ever believe. And why couldn't Abu Jahal? And Abu Lahab believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam because this is what happened. Because since Rasul, or when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's prophethood and nubuwwat began, they started uh, ridiculing Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They didn't believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So what happened? Eventually, over time, their hearts became dark, it blackened, and it was difficult for them to ever absorb the light and nur of iman. So this is what Abdullah bin Mubarak rahmatullah was saying that. Haram things, wrong actions, unlawful things, it blackens the heart. It's like it's killing the heart. However, on the contrary, if you refrain from unlawful things, if you refrain from haram and wrong and bad things, then it actually gives life to the heart. It gives hayat to the heart because when there's life and hayat in your heart, then you are more active. When you are active, it's more easier for you to do good deeds and good actions. Now, three famous scholars of hadith, of fiqh, and also they were famous scholars of tasawwuf and tazkiyah. Imam Ghazali rahmatullah alayhi, one. Number two, Ibn Qayyim rahimullah. And number three, Ibn Rajab Hanbali. These three famous scholars, as I was saying, they're famous in terms of their work on hadith, on fiqh. And also they were very much into spirituality and tasawwuf. And they have written many, many books on tasawwuf. And in particular, they've written an article where they've written the four poisons of the heart. The four things which kind of poisons your heart, which then makes it difficult for you to do any good actions and any good deeds. And the aim of today's talk is to just highlight these four poisons so that we can refrain ourselves from these four things. 
Now, this is slightly different from an earlier talk which I did regarding the vile characteristics of the heart because when we talk about vile characteristics or resilience, that's got to do with the heart. So it starts in the heart, it grows in the heart, it escalates in the heart. So like take an example of envy or hatred. So that starts in the heart, it escalates in the heart, it kind of grows in the heart to other things. But these four actions which I'm going to mention or four poisons of the heart, they are actually external things. Things which are, doesn't actually start with the heart. They are external things. But because we don't actually think of it to be something, I don't know, a sin sometimes. Because that's sometimes very dangerous as well. Sometimes certain actions, when we don't think of it to be a sin or something bad, that can also be very, very dangerous. Because then what happens? We keep on doing it without realizing it's bad, without realizing it's sin. And we're trying to do mehnat in terms of a tazkiyah and purification side, but we're then eating up all the good deeds and the good actions by doing these unlawful and haram things. So as I was saying that these four things, they're external, but it has an effect on our hearts. And the best way to explain this is think of your heart to be a big massive tank or like a, a pool or something. And there's various pipes which are linked to your heart. Now the same way, just say if you have a tank and there's many pipes, but if one of the pipe, if some impure water was to get inside, it will come into the tank and it will make the remaining water in the tank impure and nudges. Exactly same when it comes to the spiritual side, that your heart is a tank in terms of it's absorbing the barakah and the blessings. But if you now are absorbing or if you are kind of like inhaling, bad things and unlawful things in then what's happening is that the barakah which you are trying to absorb it's now getting washed away because of the bad things and the unlawful things which you are doing now these four things as i said that they're very very important because we do them sometimes and we don't realize that they are very very severe now the first thing which i'm going to touch on the first poison of the heart is unnecessary talking unnecessary talking i talking when there is no need for a person to talk unnecessary talking now let me explain in a hadith rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said fal yaqul khayran aw yasmut which means that if you need to talk fal yaqul khayran say good so when you open your mouth make sure what is coming out is good things so it's like a talk lecture dhikr tasbih good things and if you have nothing good to say, Awliyasmut, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that in that situation, keep that close. Be quiet. Now the reason why this is something which is very, very important is because there's two things. When there's no need for you to talk and you talk, there can be of two scenarios. The first scenario is you may be thinking that what you're saying is the haq and the truth. But even then, in another hadith, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, Min husnil islam il mar'i tarku ma la ya'ni. Which means that a sign of a person's iban and islam is tarku ma la ya'ni, which means he leaves out things which does not concern him. Things which do not bot, which doesn't concern him, as you say, it's not his problem. So things which not uh, concerning him, which has got nothing to do with him, he leaves that out. So just say for example, you want to get involved in a talk or an argument, even though what you may be saying is the truth, what you may think that, or I'm telling the hockey and the truth, but because Rasulullah has said that a sign of a person's hushyari and his good iman is that he leaves out things which does not concern him, then by you giving your 50 pence worth there, what's happening is that you're going against the hadith of Rasulullah So that's one. And the second way to look at it is that when a person, when he speaks in situations where he's not supposed to speak, then the second possibility will be that he's either going to be backbiting about someone, slandering about someone, or telling like all these telltales and stories and things which are made up of lie, false things which are unlawful and haram. And this is one of the nasihat or one of the advice which one of my teachers gave me. He said that whenever you do a talk or a dars, he goes, just, just tell the people the Quran, Hadith and what you need to tell them. Don't go into Kissa Kahaniyas because that's what sometimes happens when 
imams when they go into when they talk, give talks they go into kissa kahaniyas and many of these kissa kahaniyas actually untrue you know they're not true they're just like made up so instead of going into made up stories instead of going into fabricated stories and lies and then going against the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam just stick to the point whatever the quran and the hadith and whatever the fuqaha the jurists the muhaddithin the mufassirin have said stick to that don't come up with kissa kahaniyas about you know horses or about donkeys or about you know this and that this person this person because many of these stories sometimes you hear these weird and strange and you know rare stories but many of them are actually untrue they all fabricate people just make it up people have got a lot of time on their hands so they make up these stories and they just say for the juma khutbah and so on so these things many of them are untrue and because they fabricated and lies you will be then spreading lies which is obviously something unlawful and haram so as i was saying that unnecessary talking is something which we have to abstain from and this can further be elaborated from a nada hadith which imam munziri rahimullah has mentioned in his at-targhib wa tarheem this is very very important this hadith narrated by hazza anas radhi anhu that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has said that a person's iman cannot be right unless his heart is right okay so that's understandable if your heart is wrong if there's like vile characteristics in your heart if there's resides in your heart then obviously your iman's not going to be firm so your iman will be firm if your heart is firm then the next part of the hadith rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam then goes on to say that your heart will never be firm or right unless your tongue is right meaning that if you have a habit of backbiting if you have a habit of slandering then your backbiting your slandering that's having an effect in your heart so even though you're spending so much time in your dhikr in tazkiya in tasawwuf in the path of suluk but you're just wiping away your deeds and your actions by backbiting about someone by unnecessarily talking about things which does not concern you so this is what rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam say is that firstly you need to sort your tongue out speak when you are required to speak things which does not concern you kissa kahaniya these kind of tell tales i heard this person say this i heard this person say that qila wa qal which we call it and as i mentioned before that this qila wa qal this kind of like information we get and then we spread it to other people without checking its uh, authenticity is a total uh, it's totally against the command of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a verse in surah hujurat allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu in ja'akum fasikum bi naba'in fatabayyanu which means that if an information comes to you fatabayyanu check for its authenticity and this unfortunately is something which we hardly ever do one person just gives us the information that uh, mufti sahib is like this we say okay mufti sahib is like that and we just believe in it believe in that person however the order of the quran is fatabayyan you should check for that information so as i was saying that because whenever because when we speak if we're not speaking the truth or if we're not uh, saying things when we should abstain from saying it because most of the time it's going to be backbiting it's going to be slandering it's going to be telling tales about other people and this is something which the quran has uh, totally uh, condemned and this is something which we as muslims in general should not be doing so as i was saying that number one the first poison or the first thing which we should refrain from is unnecessary talking and i'll just mention another hadith which is similar to the one i mentioned and this said this can be found in sunan at-tirmizi narrated by sayyiduna ibn umar radhi anhu that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that do not talk excessively without the remembrance of allah meaning that when you're talking when you're speaking always make sure that it's got a theme of dhikrullah there a remembrance of allah so whether you're doing dhikr verbal dhikr whether it's loud zikr whether it's silent zikr or whether when you're talking it has to be within the ambit of the sharia where either directly or indirectly allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name is mentioned if you keep, if you're talking for hours and hours without allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name being mentioned uh directly or indirectly then what happens the hadith goes on to say that it will cause the heart to harden like talking excessively 
without Allah's name causes the heart to harden. And then the hadith goes on to say that the person who is furthest from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al qalbul qasi, is that person whose heart is hard. So that person who's got like a sakht dil, as we say in Urdu, like really hard heart, who doesn't remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who randomly talks about things which doesn't concern him, backbites and so on, he is actually is far, far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not the idea of tasawwuf and tazkiyah. The whole idea of tazkiyah, purification of the soul, is to purify our souls and to make sure that we connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But by ex you know, excessively talking, you know, talking about things which does not concern us, then what happens, we are actually moving away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we don't want. So that is the first poison of the heart, is uh, unnecessary talking. The second poison of the heart, as I said, these are external actions, but because of these external actions, it has an effect on us spiritually, is looking at unlawful women. Ghaddul Basar has mentioned in the Holy Quran in many places. Now, as I was saying before, that our eyes, our senses, our mouth, our ears, they are all pipes towards our heart. So if we hear, say, bad things with our ears, if we listen to music, if we listen to slandering, if we're listening to backbiting, then the ears, it will hear it and then it'll pass on to our heart and then all the good things which you've done, it'll kind of wash you away and wipe you away. Similarly, when it comes to food, which we're going to look at later, like eating haram and so on, unlawful things, then that will also have an effect on us spiritually. Exactly same with our eyes as well, that our <laughs> eyes are linked with our heart. So if we are seeing things, bad things, fahish things, either on the televisions or outside on magazines, on papers, that also has an effect on our heart as well. Now, as I was saying that lowering our gaze, it's not one of those tazkiyah things. It's not, it's not actually, if we don't put suluk and tasawwuf out of the way, it's actually an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Nur Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he firstly, he does khitab, he orders the men and then the women. Allah says, Kullil mu'minina yaguddu min absarihim. And then there's another order to women where Allah says, Wa kullil mu'minat yaguddudna min absarihinna. So what we can derive is that men, it is impermissible for them to look at unlawful women. And also at the same time, it is impermissible for women to look at unlawful men. And I don't want to go into this in detail because obviously everybody knows why Islam prohibits intermingling and so on. Because it kind of leads to unlawful relationship, leads to zina, adultery and fornication. There's no need for us to get into here. But what we need to look at here from a spiritual point of view is that looking at unlawful women, you know, it removes what we call halawatul iman. It removes the <coughs> sweetness of iman. Because in another hadith, Rasulullah sallam has mentioned, and he said these can be found in Musnad Ahmad, that whoever, say for example, had the opportunity to look at an unlawful woman, just say on the street there was a beautiful woman, and he wanted to look at her. Very pretty, nice face, everything, looks, the clothes, everything. So he wanted to look at her, but he turned his gaze away from her. Then the hadith says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him a sweetness of iman. Halawatul iman. Subhanallah. Look, this is what we are craving for through tazkiyah, through tasawwuf, is to taste the sweetness of iman. We are unfortunately, many, many of us are just like Muslims or mu'min by name. We don't actually have the true quality of Iman in our heart. It's not enriched there. So this is one of the ways, you know, lowering our gaze, keeping our gaze down, we can taste the sweetness of Iman. Because as I was saying, if we don't, if we constantly looking at lawful women, because that's what happens when we look at unlawful women, whether on the television, whether on the internet, you know, then what happens is that we then you know, have these feelings for these women. And then, you know, the noor and the barakah in your heart, it totally, totally evaporates. Then you're always starting from the, you know, from the first level. You then try to do your dhikr, so you go to a certain uh, level. But then you look at unlawful women, then you go down again. You know, you, uh, you do namaz, you pray your fajr, then you look at unlawful woman, then you, it goes down again, you pray your zuhur, you reach another level, then you look at unlawful woman, you get cravings and feelings for her, then it goes down. And this will always happen. 
So if you want to always uh, escalate and go high in your Tazkiyah, in the level of your Iman, so that we can reach the ultimate, which is the sweetness of our Iman, it's very important that we save ourselves from looking at unlawful women and casting our gaze at unlawful women. So that was the second, what we call, poison of the heart. The third poison of the heart is regarding food. Two things regarding food. One is amount of food and also number two, uh, haram food. Now, this has always been the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahabas thereafter, the Tabi'ins thereafter, and even of our Mashaykh that they would always eat less. You never hear any of our Mashaykhs eating food to their full and having big bellies. Obviously, you may say, oh, well, I see this Imam's got a big belly. That's, that's different. That's because of lack of exercise. We're not, we're not going to go into there. But that's lack of exercise. What I'm trying to say is that generally when they're probably eating, they probably eat less. And this is the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you should eat less, all right, not to fill your belly up. Because what happens is when you fill your belly, is you then become lethargic. And when you become lethargic, then it becomes difficult, to, difficult for you to do any good deeds and any good actions. It's actually mentioned in a hadith of, um, actually mentioned in one of the hadiths here, that when a person, when he eats too much, then he feels sleepy. And when you start sleeping, then you lose out. Now, what do you mean by you lose out? You won't be able to wake up for tahajjud. Or when you're kind of lethargic and when you're kind of sleepy, you're not able to pray your salah properly. You just like do the minimum what you required, say for maghrib, three rakats and then the two rakats of sunnah afterwards. Then you don't feel like doing any awwabin. Or when it comes to isha, you forget about the sunnahs before. You just do the first two rakats afterwards with her and then you go home. So that's what happens when you eat too much, you become lethargic. And when you become lethargic, you feel sleepy. And when you feel sleepy, as the hadith mentioned, you got too much, you lose out too much. Meaning, you're not able to concentrate on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's worship and ibadah. Obviously, more importantly, you're not able to wake up for tahajjud and the night prayers. So this is one part of uh, the, the food aspect, the amount of food. And also something which is very, very important is making sure that the food which we eat has to be halal. Okay, not just halal by name. Sometimes you see like non-Muslim butchers, they've got halal meat or non-Muslim chip shop, they got halal fish and chips or halal chicken and so on. Not just, just because it says halal on the window, it doesn't mean that it's halal. You need to make sure that the food you're eating has to be totally halal. Because again, unlawful food, haram food, spiritually it has an effect <coughs> on your heart. Because remember, as I explained before, that the, in the heart, in our spiritual heart, we've got the nur of iman there. So it's like a light glowing. But if we start eating and consuming haram things, if we start consuming mashkuk or doubtful things, then what happens slowly, slowly, the light of Iman extinguishes, it goes away, and then we're back to what I've explained before, a hard heart where it then becomes difficult for us to you know, do any form of dhikr, any form of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any form of worship. So that's also very important. The third poison of the heart <coughs> is to avoid eating uh, you know, too much food but what we eat, we have to make sure what we're consuming, we have to make sure that it is halal and it's not unlawful and haram. And the last, the fourth poison of the heart is here, bad company. Bad friends. Bad friends, remember, bad people, they will never ever help you. They will never ever assist you in achieving your goal or your aim of tazkiyah and purification of the heart. Now, don't get me wrong, generally speaking in Islam, we encourage silatul arham, we encourage maintaining ties, like keep friendship, kinship, cousins, relatives and so on. We actually encourage that. But even in Islam, there are certain occasions where you're allowed to break up friendship. If someone is a very, very bad person, if he's a really bad influence on you, you can actually break friends with him. It's mentioned even Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a Sahabi in the name of Ka'b bin Malik anhu, he once didn't go for the battle of Tabuk. So remember in those days, going for jihad, going for a battle, it was further and obligatory for every Sahabi to go. <coughs> but this Sahabi, Ka'b bin Malik anhu, didn't go for this battle. 
So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was so upset with him that for 50 days he broke off all communication. He broke off all form of contact with Hazrat Qab bin Malik al Anhu. So that is the example of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself. Uh, with the intention of Islam, temporarily he broke off his uh, contact and communication with Hazrat Qab bin Malik al Anhu. So as I was saying that there are occasions when in Islam, when people are bad influence, when people are giving wrong influence to you, you should stay away from them. Because as I said that if you're in a wrong environment, because being with wrong people, most likely you're going to be in the wrong environment. And when in the wrong environment, again, it has an effect, it has an author on your heart. So these are the four things we, which we have to make sure that we refrain from. They are number one, unnecessary talking. Number two, lowering our gaze making sure that we're not looking at unlawful women number three to avoid eating excessively and that what we're eating making sure that it is halal and lawful and lastly number four making sure that we don't hang around with bad people and with people who can have an adverse effect on us Remember, we should always try to be with the mashayikh if that is not possible with the ulamas if that is not possible say here then probably with your umarazia yeah? you should try to be with them in the zikr gatherings because you know being with good people being in the gatherings of zikr as mentioned the hadith or in the gardens of jannah and paradise so these are all good things so we should try and stick with the jamaat we should try and stick with good people so that we can save ourselves from bad and unlawful things now i'll just finish off by mentioning a few things so i mentioned what we call the four poisons of the heart now how can we strengthen our iman how can we strengthen our heart now there's three ways number one is continuously or continuing with our ma'mulats continuing with our remembrance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allah bi dhikrillah tatma'innul kulub so what strengthens our heart what gives contentment to our heart is the remembrance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that's one number two a second thing which is very important is to abide by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and number three which is closely linked with number two is to follow the ways of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Two and three are very similar. That whatever we do, whatever we do, whether we want to do something good, whether we want to say for example do something say dunyawi like open a business, you know, do something, do something like that, then we need to always ask ourselves that what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Rasul Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wasallam have decreed or have said regarding this. Everything we should always ask ourselves, what does Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam have said? If they said do this, then we should do it. If they have said that not to do this, then we should abstain or refrain from it. So this is also very important as well to follow the ways of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And this is a topic which I've uh, mentioned many times before and you may be thinking why does Mufti Sahib always talk about following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? The reason we talk about it is because those of us who are on Masjid al-Nabawi uh, sabak you know you should be getting the kayfiyat of following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi having the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in your heart. And that can only be shown by if you are acting upon the sunnah. So it's very, very important that slowly, slowly we should be implementing the sunnahs in our lives. And as I explained before that when we mean sunnah, we mean sunnah internally and externally. Not just like externally, just have the beard and have the jubba and the topi and think, mashallah, we're acting upon the sunnah. No, internally we need to be following the sunnah. And internally goes back to what we have gathered here today, i.e. the purification of the heart. The sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the sahaba, the companions, was that they would, they would show the sunnah and their love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam externally by the, what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wore, they wore that, what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's facial features, they tried to implement that in their lives. But also internally, they also tried to act upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had a clean and a pure heart, they also had a clean and a pure heart as well. And I'll finish off with that hadith I mentioned before in Oxford, but I'll mention this hadith again and what Imam Qurtubi rahmatullahi says regarding this hadith, a very famous hadith, 
of uh, Sahih Muslim narrated <coughs> by Sayyiduna Abu Huraira al Anhu that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam has said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he does not look at your actions so, sorry Allah subhanahu doesn't look at your beauty or your face that's the first part of the hadith that inna Allah la yanzur Allah doesn't look at your face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't look at your beauty so on the day of judgment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at whether you're beautiful, whether you're pretty, whether your nose is perfect, whether your eyes are perfect. Allah will not look mm. at that, whether you got blue eyes, whether you got blonde hair. Allah is not going to look at that. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to look at in the hereafter is your actions. وَقُلُوبِكُمْ And your hearts. Meaning Allah will look at what you did exactly in this world and this dunya and also your heart. And from this hadith, Imam Qurtubi rahimullah, who's a very famous uh, scholar of the Quran, tafsir, mufassir of the Holy Quran, he said regarding this hadith that sometimes when we see people do certain things, we should not judge them. So just say we saw someone, remember as I explained before that if you see someone doing haram, that's different. But if you see someone doing something a bit strange, a bit kind of like shaky, then don't be quick to judge him and say, oh, he's like this, he's like that. Because you don't know what's in his heart. Now, what he may be doing, that slightly disliked thing which you may be doing, he may have done it with good intentions. And similarly, Imam Qurtubi Rahmutah then goes on to say that if you see a person who's doing good deeds and good actions, don't be too haste and start judging him or he's a saint or he's a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you don't know why is he doing that for. So you see someone praying salah. You've never seen him ever pray salah but today you see him pray salah. So don't be too haste and, and, uh, haste and say, oh well now nah, he's a changed man. He's now a saint of Allah because you don't know why he's actually praying. It could be to please someone else or he's giving sadqa or charity then don't be too hasty and say, oh, well, he's so, so rich and so, so good and so, so pious because his intentions may be different or what is in his heart may be different. So this is what is the, the whole purpose or the root of Tazki and Tasawwuf is that we look to our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to act on what has been said.